AI is already the main driver in emerging technologies like big data and robotics. But it's now getting more attention because of its sophistication in creating original works from art to videos. Kartik Hosaniger explains how this technology is changing the world. I met Hosaniger at the San Francisco campus of the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, where he teaches technology and digital business. He received the MBA Teaching Excellence Award at the Wharton School and has been recognized as one of the world's top 40 business professors under 40. I saw an interview with an acclaimed author many years back where he talked about writing a book and he talked about the first sentence that it's critical. And the reason why I bring that up is because I, I really love your introduction. In your first sentence, Yuang Zhong doesn't think of herself as someone who makes friends easily. And you don't think, how does this get into AI? But you tell this really interesting story. So do you agree with the contention? And then how much did you labor over, how am I going to start this book? It's interesting to hear you say that. Um, so I didn't spend as much time worrying about the first sentence, but I did think about the first anecdote or the first, uh, let's call it the first page. Um, and, and you're right, in the first page, I don't really even discuss technology, discuss AI, and I'm mostly talking about this teenage girl in China and her day-to-day -day life and how she's interacting with this celebrity. And then we, the reader, learn at some point that the celebrity that she's interacting with, the celebrity who has 40 million followers on social media in China, ultimately, ends up being an AI chatbot that is chatting with 40 million followers uh, over time. And I did choose that anecdote intentionally because I felt like I wanted to accomplish a few things with that introduction. The first is to start with a human story uh, and ultimately not have this be something that people cannot connect with. And a lot of people feel like AI is this esoteric thing that I hear about in the news. It doesn't affect me, my life. It's not part of my day-to-day. -day. And I wanted to bust that myth a little bit uh, because it's not true and AI is actually all around us. Um, and so I wanted to get into that. But I also wanted to reel people in with a story that felt more personal and then say, hey, this, this teenage girl actually has AI in her life every day and she didn't realize it for the long, longest uh, time. Hosenegger is the author of the book, A Human's Guide to Machine Intelligence, how algorithms are shaping our lives and how we can stay in control. Algorithms, how, how far are they entrenched in our lives right now? Because as you mentioned, a lot of people think of AI as this kind of futuristic thing, but it's here now. Algorithms are all around us. Um, and most of us have heard of the term by now and not many of us realize what exactly is it? Where am I using algorithms and, or, or not? But, but yes, they're all around us. So for example, when you go to Amazon and you're looking at a product to buy, you might see recommendations. You know, people who bought this product also bought these other products or here are other products you might like. That's a recommendation algorithm that is recommending products that might be of interest to you. When you go to Netflix, you know, an algorithm again says, hey, you might consider watching these titles. That's an algorithm for you. On YouTube, on TikTok, algorithms are again recommending content. And these algorithms are having a huge impact on choices we make. For example, at Amazon, research studies show that over a third of the purchases that people make on Amazon originate from algorithmic recommendations. On, say, a, a media site like YouTube, it's even greater at YouTube, 90% of the time people spend on YouTube is influenced by algorithmic recommendations. On Netflix, 80% of choices people make originate in algorithmic recommendations. Even dating increasingly is happening uh, on these apps and the apps are ultimately suggesting who people should date and eventually who they should marry. And so while we kind of think of algorithms as this, um, you know, esoteric concept, they're all around us. And not only are they all around us, we have this illusion of choice. They're actually driving a lot of decisions for us. So there are some who say, okay, it's fine if it's a suggestion, but when does it kind of morph into manipulation? 
I think the boundary between suggestion and manipulation is a fuzzy boundary. It's not very clear. So on the one hand, I don't want to go back to the old world where anytime I needed to make a choice, I have to sit and do deep research, looking at all of the different options. There's so many options out there. I might even fall back on a bestseller list, and so all of us just consume the same 10, 15 titles, so whether it's music choices, previously driven by billboard uh, lists, or book choices driven by New York Times bestseller lists, and so on. And the challenge with that is, I am consuming what is globally popular, but I'm not consuming what is unique to my personality. And now I'm in a world where I have even more choices. And so if I have to rely on you know, these kinds of bestseller lists or spend hours doing research, that's inefficient. And so I love the fact that an Amazon will say, people who like this book also like these others. And, and I'll discover books that way. And I'll, you know, when I'm trying to buy a camera, I don't have to spend five hours on research. I can narrow my options down very fast with that. So all of that is in the world of suggestion and really driving efficiency for me. And that's great. But let's go to the other extreme and talk about how these systems might actually be manipulating me. So let's think about what are the business models of the companies that are deploying these algorithms. So most of the online media sites, their business model is advertising. And so they make money by having me spend more time on those sites. So if I go to YouTube and it's auto-playing videos one after the other, and if I'm not very conscious and aware of what's going on, I meant to spend five minutes there to watch a video, and before I know it, I've been there for an hour and a half. They benefit from creating digital addiction. That's crossing the line. And then there's a lot of gray area in between. And the gray area in between is really all about where do you draw the line between what is helpful to me and what is my inability to control myself. One potential concern about AI is its creation of filter bubbles where viewpoints that you don't agree with get filtered out of what you see online. Let me ask you about the bubbles, these filter bubbles that we all live in. When we think of social media, it's so funny that, you know, like it can give me suggestions on, and yet you could have an entirely different point of view because of your political leanings. Is that separating us more? And, and what's the concern there? Because we seem so divisive, at least here in the U.S. Does this fuel this in a sense? I mean, there's no doubt that as a society, we're way more polarized today than sometime back say 30, 40 years back. And there's many factors behind it, one of which, which has nothing much to do with modern technology, is the fact that news media in general can cater to individual interests rather than trying to cater to the masses. So when you had just one television station, the news outlet had to cater to everyone, and so had to cover all kinds of news stories, all kinds of perspectives. But once you enter into a world where you've got a Fox News catering to conservatives, MSNBC catering to liberals, and something else catering to moderates and so on, then you don't see cross-cutting news. You don't hear other perspectives anymore. But, but AI takes that to a different level, where not only is that happening, but now when you're consuming news content on social news feeds, like on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or wherever, an algorithm decides what you see. And there's been a lot of concerns over the last 10 years about whether algorithms are creating filter bubbles. And that turns out to be due to a few different factors. The first, who do we connect with? Who are our friends? And we end up connecting more with people who share our political viewpoints. In fact, some of us are known to even unfriend people who share a perspective that is different from ours. And so that's not good because it doesn't expose us to those perspectives. The second factor is when they share a cross-cutting perspective, do we see it or not? And the algorithm decides whether we see it or not. 
And indeed, the algorithms do cause polarization because they show us more of what we like rather than what we usually don't uh, engage with. And the third, given the content shows up in our newsfeed, do we watch it? Do we click on it and do we read it? And turns out that we are not likely to click on news stories that share other perspectives. And so again, it comes back to us. So yes, algorithms do cause polarization, but so do the choices we make in terms of who we connect with, what we click on, and so on. AI is already playing a big role in healthcare. It helps in disease diagnosis, medical imaging analysis, drug discovery, personalized medicine, and patient monitoring. Um, and, you know, I've asked some questions that tend to be asked a lot about the negative aspects of AI. But I, I heard you in a podcast describing AI in much the same way you would describe somebody discovering fire when they were cavemen or the computer. So talk to us about how transformative it's going to be and about, you know, those people who want to not embrace it. I mean, it's here. You you have to it at some point, right? I mean, it's not going away. It's not going away. So for the first group of skeptic that thinks that this is overhyped, I like to say that, yes, this technology is going to be like the printing press or like electricity, like computers or like the internet, meaning there's life before AI and there's life, life after AI and they're going to be very different. And in fact, there's good doc, good research evidence for that. So in the research world, we have a term for these kinds of technologies that we refer to as general purpose technologies. General purpose technologies are technologies that uh, are known to change society in a big way. At a macro level, they stimulate innovation, they drive economic growth in a big way. At a micro level, meaning at individual firm level, they decide who the winners and losers are. Um, and the internet has done that. And then I think there's the other group of skeptics who worry that technology can have unanticipated, undesirable outcomes. And I believe in that, and technology can have it. But like you said, I don't think we can fight our way to a point where this technology doesn't exist. And the fact is the technology has so much value to offer. So I think the right approach has to be, how do we use this as a force of good? You know, how do we make sure uh, that, you know, you get the benefits of like nuclear fusion, meaning energy, but not the atom bomb. And so how do we use AI to ultimately get us to a point where we all have so much free time that maybe we have to work not five days a week, but I don't know, three days a week. We have enough time to pursue our hobbies, to spend time with our families. Uh, you know, we only work on things that are meaningful and a source of joy for us. So growing up in India, there was no AI. So how did you get to where we are today? You're right. There was no AI when I was growing up in India. In fact, even when I did my engineering courses and took my computer science courses, we didn't have very many courses that were focused on AI. Because at that point in time, AI hadn't delivered on its promise. So most AI that had, that had been built was very simple stuff, you know, but it couldn't solve real problems that we had. My first exposure to AI happened when I was doing my PhD at Carnegie Mellon University. And the legendary professor on campus was a professor by the name of uh, Herb Simon. It was a massive class, meaning large auditorium, lots of students in there. And most of what we talked about was not things that particularly interested me, but uh, nonetheless, because I was in presence of, uh, you know, this great mind, I showed up and I listened to what this professor had to say. Many years later, I got exposed to the kinds of research questions I study through students. And so this is a really interesting uh, example of students teaching professors because you know, sometimes we teach the students, but we often, often learn a lot from students. So a student of mine who was in a graduate class was reacting to something I, that I mentioned in class. And I mentioned how algorithms introduce us to lots of new and novel products and expose us to products that, and content that we might not otherwise be aware of. And he brought up the possibility that because algorithms are trying to customize their recommendations to our preferences. Might they narrow 
our options? Might they narrow the sets of content that we might look at? Might they even have a popularity bias because they recommend things that others have consumed? And so that led to a conversation, a debate with, amongst us. It led to a research study. It led me to go deeper into how these algorithms were designed. And then before I knew it, my research direction actually changed to focus more on the impact of algorithms, including AI-driven algorithms on choices people make and on society at large. AI algorithms are also employed in gaming for creating realistic virtual characters, opponent behavior, and intelligent decision-making. Beyond entertainment, this technology is transforming how people train for jobs and sometimes even do jobs that humans now perform. Um, as you look at the landscape, uh, what jobs are going to be impacted or do you think much about that? Yeah, so I mentioned that AI is a general purpose technology. One of the features of a general purpose technology is that it is a technology that affects not just one industry, but almost all industries out there. And it affects multiple job functions, not just one job function. So for example, computers, initially it was software engineers and the information technology industry that adopted computers and used it. But over time, you know, is there a job that doesn't use computers today? Um, and so AI is going to be like that. It, you know, there's probably very few jobs that are not going to be affected by technology. But these jobs can be affected in two ways. One is enhanced by technology, where some portion of what they do is done by the technology, but some other portion remains. But another impact is completely replaced by technology, meaning those jobs are gone. So I think jobs, unfortunately, like drivers, you know, we employ millions of people in those jobs. Now, it won't happen in the next five to 10 years, but is it going to eventually happen that a lot of driving work can be done by AI? I think so. Uh, you can get into a lot of other jobs. Radiology you know, is a, a job where you have to interpret images and figure out, um, you know, again, X-rays, MRIs, you know, is there a problem here or not? You've got an enough, a large enough training data set AI can do that, and so will we need as many radiologists? Probably not. Does it mean radiologists disappear? Definitely not, but you know, we might need radiologists only for the most complicated images and scans and, and issues. So again, I think the writers and actors have concerns for a good reason. Uh, you know, today we're not at a point where AI can write great content, it can write you know, decent content, so the low skill writing jobs, um, not the high end Hollywood writing jobs, but writing jobs like you know writing a uh, copy for an ad, uh, you know those could be replaced by AI pretty soon. Eventually, will it get into a, a Hollywood? Likely. Um, so yeah, I think the jobs that are going to stay, that will be the last to be affected by AI, or last to be replaced, are going to be jobs that require, you know, creativity. And so that's why I feel the Hollywood writers are not under immediate threat. Um, there are going to be jobs that require compassion and ability to connect with humans. So psychiatrists, you know, doctors, again, a little more protected. So I like to look at, you know, you know, if I were, for example, talking to my kids and trying to make sure, you know, you're relevant 20 years from now, I'd focus a lot on their soft skills. You know, can they connect with people really well uh, on creativity, on leadership? Uh, I think these are skills that are going to matter more and more. Uh, hard analytical skills are going to be important, but AI is going to get into that. And I think even software engineers, low-end software, uh, and by low-end, I mean entry-level software engineer, engineering jobs, are going to be significantly enhanced by AI, wherein we might not need as many entry-level engineers as we did, uh, you know, say even five years back. If you were to kind of go to Washington, D.C. and spend some time with legislators or even at the White House, what are areas where they should stay away and what are areas they should focus on? Because this is a key part, isn't it? Policy. Policy is extremely important. Now, I sit in a business school. I'm pro-business, but I'll be one of the first to say that AI needs to be regulated in some way. I worry that the companies controlling AI are going to be very powerful and you need to have certain 
uh, guardrails to protect citizens. And so I propose a few in my book, and there's a number of things in there. One of the concepts in there is of awareness, meaning a company should reveal when they're using AI to make decisions, especially in socially impacting, uh, impactful or socially consequential situations like using AI for loan approvals or using AI for recruiting or using AI for criminal sentencing. You know, revealing that uh, AI is being used, revealing details about the AI. Now, to be clear, I had not suggested in my book that this needs to be legislation, but this needs to be a set of policy prescriptions. And that's what the White House has done, where this is not law that's been passed, but these are suggestions by White House to companies almost as an act of self-regulation. I have also argued in the book there needs to be an algorithmic safety board that is modeled, say, like the Federal Reserve, you know, an entity that can monitor what's going on and that can figure out when they need to interfere. And so you have new issues coming up with generative AI. You've got to worry about is intellectual property being respected or can any company use my work as training data to create AI that starts to write like me or starts to paint like me, how would I be compensated for that? Do we have to worry about uh, you know, how much fake news there is on the internet because AI can now uh, make it very easy for uh, anyone with malicious intent to create lots of fake content, spread it around and influence people's opinion around elections or cause, cause disharmony among people polarize people in different ways. So you need regulations to tackle a lot of that. And we're, we're not at a point where our regulators fully understand that. Uh, I think the U.S. needs to act soon. And we will end with that wake-up call. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.